Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. We're your hosts, Dr. Jessica Steyer. And Dr. Andrea Love. And this week, we're actually recording a bit of an emergency episode in response to a policy statement uh, that came across our screens shortly before the, the holidays. Um, that we felt really warranted a response. And, and we're joined by not one, but two experts to speak on this topic comprehensively. Um, so without further ado, let's dig in. Oh, and by the way, Happy New Year. I just realized this is going to air, um, I believe it's January 3rd. Our first um, episode of the new year, and we are not shying away from controversy. No, we're, we're, we're coming in hot. Um, and, and, you know, of course, uh, you know, happy, happy to have survived 2023, and we have high hopes for 2024. Um, all right. So let me, inter well, actually, let me just set the stage super briefly. So what was the date? It was December 11th when um, we were scrolling social media and we saw that the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AAP, they posted a new policy on GMOs. And I'll just read the one sentence Instagram post that, that I saw, which is that more research is needed into GMOs effect on children. Pediatricians can help families think through the cost and health impacts of their food choices. All right, I know we have a lot to say. Let me introduce our two guests and then we'll we'll just get right in. And just a really brief apology if my quality is is not as good as usual today. Um, I had hid everything for Christmas, we were hosting, and I can't find my camera, I can't find my microphone, so I am so sorry, but we had to make this work. All right, so our first guest is Dr. Kevin Folta. He is a professor in the Horticultural Sciences Department at the University of Florida. He, com he completed a PhD in molecular biology at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and postdoc work at the University of Wisconsin. His research analyzes the molecular and genetic circuits that control flowering time and accumulation of flavors and aromas in fruit crops. Essentially, he's been in the field of molecular biology in the context of plant biology for decades. Uh, he was rec recognized with multiple awards for research and science communication, including the NSF Career Award and the Cast Borlaug Award, I hope I'm saying that correctly, in agricultural communication. He also raises fruits, veggies, eggs, and turkeys with his wife in rural Florida. And he's also the host of the Talking Biotech podcast since 2015 with 430 weekly episodes. Our next guest is Dr. Nicole Keller. Nicole is a general pediatrician who treats kids of all ages in suburban and rural areas of her Midwest home. She is chair of the pediatric department at her medical center and as such has been involved in actively updating best care practices for her pediatric patients and community. She became a farmer's wife during residency, which is when she first started to be interested in agricultural topics as they crossed paths with medical recommendations. And she is also a member of the AAP. Um, Nicole and Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's fun to be on a podcast I like. <laughs> <laughs> well, we like to hear that. Um, so, so obviously, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, we're going to talk about obviously the the science um, behind genetic engineering technology, the the data on food GMOs in particular. Um, Kevin is, you know, an expert on this topic. Um, you know, and and I think it's really worth um, underscoring that you know, Nicole, you reached out to us because you were so. Um, you know, fearful of the consequences of both patient care, public health, and literacy as a member of AAP and as someone who crafted a, honestly, a really eloquent and, and diplomatic letter to AAP about this paper. Um, and, you know, as we'll talk about, Kevin has reached out to the authors and the editors. 
Um, and there doesn't seem much to be much of an impetus to correct a lot of these glaring omissions and, and outright falsehoods. Now, we have talked about genetic engineering, GMOs, organic agriculture, myths and misconceptions about all of those topics at length in, in previous podcast episodes. Um, so we're really going to focus specifically on this this statement by the AAP, which ultimately is going to become a publication, a published piece in pediatrics, which is the the journal of the AAP that's going to come out this month, January 2024. And ultimately, it is a gross mi misrepresentation on the, the totality of the evidence on what we have with regard to GMOs, foods, pediatric populations, health, and so on. So, you know... Andrew, sorry, just super briefly, and we'll link to those past episodes, of course, in our show notes. We'll repost them to our stories. Um, and I also just wanted to mention, you know, we had dozens of people reach out to us in our DMs saying, oh, my gosh, do I need to be scared about feeding my kids GMOs? And, you know, even if, let's say they come to their senses and they issue some sort of correction, retraction, whatever it is, a lot of damage has already been done. And I know that we're going to talk about that. Um, on this episode. Sorry, Andrea, go on. No, that's both totally fine. It's actually a good segue. So, you know, GMO foods are extensively studied. They have been studied for decades. They, they are more studied than any other food product that we consume because they fall under the purview of multiple regulatory agencies, including the FDA, the EPA, and the USDA. And unfortunately, uh, misinformation, and we'll talk about some of the, the rehashing of pieces of misinformation in this piece, but also low science literacy <clears throat> and the appeal to emotion has led to a lot of undue fear about genetic technologies broadly, but GMOs, um, as well as conventionally grown foods with regard to um, false claims about pesticides. So, you know, let's, let's dig in. Let's start from kind of the... Aside from kind of the individual false claims and, and misinformation in the piece, let's talk about the more glaring issues with regard to the actual writing of the piece and the, um, the sources, or rather some of the sources that are omitted um, when, when you actually read through this article. So Kevin, I'm going to hand it over to you first to maybe kick things off. Yeah, this paper was a real problem because as an editor and a reviewer and an author and as someone who instructs graduate students in scientific writing, this thing was unacceptable. It was a complete fail. It showed citation bias, only uh, using citations which supported their narrative. They clearly had a thesis that they wanted to find, which is completely the opposite of the way we do science. Uh, anything that didn't agree with their, con with their conclusion went inside the review. and just uh, so much out of context in terms of the amounts of pesticide exposure, which drives me crazy, um, but so many errors and, and the uh, logical fallacy, uh, just writing everything to emphasize fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's what this was, this was all about. This was about scaring parents. This was not about talking about the current state of a, of a very well-studied science. Yeah, and it's really, you know, and Nicole, I'm going to hand it over to you in a second, but, you know, when, when you know, something that, that Jess and myself are constantly reiterating is that when you go to PubMed or Google Scholar or any online search database, you can find any article to support an opinion or a personal bias. But as scientists or anyone who should be doing good science if they're writing a scientific article. And unfortunately, these three pediatricians were not doing good science or even a good literature review. Um, you know, when you critically appraise the totality of evidence with regard to a topic, you include everything that is relevant. You assess the robustness or the quality of the data. We talk often about how animal studies or petri dish studies are much lower on the quality of evidence hierarchy than large-scale human randomized controlled trials. Um, if you look at, you know, clinical case reports, those are obviously also lower. Anything that's observational is lower. 
and and ultimately, you know, they strategically cherry picked, as you mentioned, Kevin, omitted papers that were more recent or more robust to demonstrate that GMOs um, are in fact safe to consume and are as nutritious and more broadly conventional foods are as nutritious. Um, and ultimately what this is going to do is mislead parents, it's going to mislead clinicians who maybe aren't as well versed with scientific methodology and assessment, and it's misrepresenting the science. And so, you know, Nicole, I want you to maybe talk a little bit about, you know, the ethos of healthcare providers, you know, this, this, you know, do no harm, this, um, you know, the failures of that, and also what you anticipate are going to be the biggest fallout with regard to your individual clinical practice, but also, you know, health and, and medical care more broadly. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so yeah, to me, you know, as a clinician, I'm supposed to be kind of the bridge between the research and the science and bringing that to the public. And so it's my responsibility to know what to uh, really listen to and what to spread as opposed to what to maybe hold off on or learn a little bit more about before I discuss that with my patients. And when this paper comes out and it's supported by an organization like the AAP, it makes it really hard for me to do that job well, because I have this huge organization saying that they're unsafe when I have learned through years of looking into it myself that these are these are misinformation. This, these are false claims. So it is. It is frustrating that that there wasn't more responsibility put on that. You know, it's that that great power and great responsibility. I think sometimes too. You know, as a doctor, I I know a lot about medicine. I know a lot about kids. I can tell you all about that kind of stuff. But what do I really know about agriculture? Even as a farmer's wife who was interested in this topic. I still sought out the information from Dr. Folta and from Dr. Gregory Bond and Dr. Carl Winter. I've talked to all these people. I had chats over the last years about this stuff, trying to really understand the science because I am a doctor and I'm not an agricultural expert. And that was not taken into account at all here either. And because of this um, lack of looking more broadly, you know, we're supposed to uh, have a multidisciplinary team and look at all that in medicine. And they didn't. They sought out their opinion and kind of just went with it. Um, and this is going to make everyday clinic a little bit more challenging. Um, I was telling Kevin last week already that last week, just alone, um, I had a dad tell me, well, I only do organic milk because it's in a carton, no plastic for my kid. Okay, fine. You know, we, we talked briefly about it, but I just thought, wow, that's a really powerful statement. Um, I've had a child with something we call failure to thrive who wasn't gaining weight. And as we delved into it, it turns out mom wanted to only buy organic food. She couldn't afford it. So she was only breastfeeding her baby and not giving food. And her baby, her, her baby's health was at risk. Um, I get families all the time, um, a multivitamin. I don't want the added sugars in that. So I'm not going to give the multivitamin, even though it's necessary. Here we've scared people away from things that are, that are appropriate for them and are causing more harm with that fear that is completely unfounded. It's, it's just totally irresponsible. Yeah. Nicole, and, and I, mm -hmm. No, go, go on, ahead, Andrea. I, oh. I was going to say. <laughs> Andrea, you go. Yeah. Um, so, so you bring up a great point, right? Because, because this, this paper, you know, and I, I, I hesitate to even call it a review because it, because it's not, because it's not reviewing the evidence. It's really no. selecting, you know, statements and, and actually poorly designed studies to support this, you know, clearly a, a preconceived opinion by these three pediatricians. And as you noted, there were no other co-authors, there were no um, molecular biologists, there were no biochemists, there were no chemists, there were no agricultural scientists, there were no, you know, engineers on there. Um, you know, they didn't consult any environmental scientists or even registered dietitians or, you know, anything right. like that. And so, you know, it's interesting because when I was reading the paper, the first thing that I, the first, you know, thing that struck me was that the talking points were very, um, they seemed like they were out of the environmental working group playbook, right? The EWG, which is the activist organization that is largely funded by organic farms, industrial organic farms. And they put out the dirty dozen, which scares people away from eating very healthy and nutritious and safe produce items, um, yep. as well as um, sunscreens and commercial products and cleaning products and, yes. um, you know, uh, consumer products for your kids. 
because they propagate this, this undue fear of chemicals. And of course they position it as, well, the conventional items are filled with chemicals and are killing you. And the organic ones are not filled with chemicals and are not killing you. And, and, you know, aside from the fact that everything is chemicals, you're a sack of chemicals. That's my favorite, you know, sl- you know, my favorite phrase at the moment, but organic farming, organic agriculture uses pesticides. They're not chemical free. They're not pesticide free. Um, and, you know, we'll get into, into more of some of the specifics there, but completely separate from the fact, if you look at the body of evidence comparing organic foods to conventionally grown foods, um, there's no healthfulness difference. There's no nutrient density difference. There's no safety difference. But what is different is that they're at least two times more expensive. And so if people are now scared to buy or or conventional produce and they can't afford afford organic produce, then what's going to happen is exactly what you said, Nicole, right? They're going to not feed their children produce. And we've actually seen this in action where this is impacting individuals of lower socioeconomic status more um, substantially for obvious reasons, right? They don't have the privilege and the luxury of just going and buying organic, um, even if you needed to, you know, which you don't. Um, And what ends up happening is that they're not eating produce, they're not eating frozen vegetables, they're not eating canned vegetables, all of these things are wonderful options. They are perfectly healthy and nutritious. They're full of great nutrients that particularly children need. Um, They're filled with fiber, which is beneficial for pretty much every bodily system in, in your body. We have a whole episode on fiber. It's good for your gut. It's good for your cardiovascular help. It helps reduce risk of cancers and other related diseases. So it's going to have this major trickle down effect for our, for public health on the whole. Nicole, that's what I was going to say is that, I mean, you just hit the nail on the head that the whole statement was dripping with elitism. I, I could not believe the way that it was phrased. I mean, Andrea, you just summarized pretty much everything that I was going to say, of course, we're on the same wavelength here. Um, But how terrible is it that there are people who are now feeling guilty and shamed away from buying produce altogether because they can't afford the higher price tag of the non-GMO organic, which as we all understand is not nutritionally superior or superior in any way. Um, Sorry, Nicole, go on. I was just going to say, I, you know, I completely agree that the elitism and, you know, they, the AEP um, aims for equity. And I think that's a fabulous thing to aim for, but gosh, we missed the ball on this one. Like we are completely throwing people in, in lower socioeconomic statuses under the bus here. Um, I, I just, it's, it's unfathomable. And, you know, to me too, we, we fight a lot in medicine about things like vaccines, right? Vaccine safety and, and that they're um, researched, the ingredients are safe. People worry about all the ingredients, just like they're worried here about GMO ingredients, which is so interesting, the parallels. Um, but we know that they're well-researched. We know what the studies say, and we support that. And the AAP does a great job with that. How did they not see here that this is that same problem, that someone's going, oh, it's aluminum and vaccines causing X, Y, Z, as a, and here they're saying it's pesticides and GMOs not letting us be healthy. It's the same argument, and they didn't see through that, and that's really um, just bewildering to me. Yeah. So before we get into some of the specific claims that I think are worth using as illustration, you know, Nicole, first from you, I want to, you know, we talked a lot about making your day to day more difficult. You know, let's talk a little bit about when these statements are going to conflict and what's that what that's going to do for you know trust and your ability to care for patients right so you know say you have a patient comes in and they're like well i follow all the aap guidance right and they say that i shouldn't be eating conventional produce anymore and you're like well actually the data you know don't demonstrate that and that was you know a flawed paper what's what's going to happen as a result of this do you envision? Yeah. You know, I only have so many minutes in my clinic visits to address all sorts of things regarding dietary things, safety, vaccines, growth, development, et cetera. And when I have to start focusing all on this, I'm going to also miss out talking on other things because I've had to focus on this that shouldn't be um, something that I really have to worry about. I should be able to say, oh, no, don't worry. The AAP, everyone, you know, agrees that GMOs are safe and you should just buy whatever produce you can find for it and looks good to you. 
Um, so that's going to be a, a day-to-day conversation that's going to change. And again, it's going to make me look like the one, the sole person that's going against the AAP and that I'm the conspiracy conspiracy person here because this big organization that's supposed to be reliable um, is, is giving out this statement. And again, I think the AAP gets a lot of things right. I, I keep saying vaccines, but I fully support them in that. And a lot of their other um, pushes and, and support. But I think that's where the responsibility here was so <laughs> not taken seriously. Um, and it's going to make conversations more challenging. I'm going to have to spend that time. Um, and it's it's just frustrating. I will say the other thing, too, that while in my clinic, this is going to be effective, um, I think, too, I'm part of a bunch of physician groups, you know, on social media and that kind of stuff. And all the time people are saying, well, I only buy the organic or should I buy organic milk or I've heard the GMOs are unsafe and I do my best to try to educate and provide sources. And in physician groups, people can't tell the difference. If physicians who are fairly educated, at least on medicine, can't tell the difference, how are we supposed to have the general public be able to tell this apart? It's it's just frustrating. Yeah. And it and it and it, of course, you know, it, it illustrates the fact that, you know, training between scientists and clinicians, healthcare providers is very different. You know, we're you know, scientists, you know, just myself, Kevin, we're not doing patient care. We're doing, you know, study design, study evaluation methodology. You know, we're doing the data analysis and the evaluation of the data, um, you know, so that you healthcare providers, clinicians can have the best, you know, yeah. methods and insight to treat individuals. Um, you know, and so it's going to, it's going to erode that, that conduit. Um, but it's also going to erode kind of literacy and trust in science more broadly. So Kevin, maybe you can comment on this being someone who's been in the agricultural sciences for, for many decades and kind of seeing this evolution and, and really this rejection of many scientific topics that really could advance, um, you know, agriculture and also public health. Well, that's a huge part of this. I've been studying genetic engineering since I was a little kid. And I grew up with, you know, through the 80s where I saw these crops starting to be developed and I saw the releases and I heard all the promises and we heard all the great things that were going to happen. And between then and now, I've watched tens of thousands of laboratories, tens of thousands of journal articles talk about here are the beautiful benefits of something we can do for the environment, something we can do for the food insecure, something we can do for the farm something we can do to control food costs. And only a little sliver of those realities has come to fruition, mostly because of tremendous pushback from false information levied by a couple of smaller organizations. And that has gained the public trust over us. And when you look at something like this, where, 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 the, um, uh, where the AAP or makes a, a mistake like this, it erodes the trust in what we do as scientists and science communicators who get out there to discuss these things based upon the literature where they don't. The problem is, is that I've been, uh, you know, front and center, like uh, in terms of Twitter, Facebook, whatever, wherever there's questions on genetic engineering, I'm glad to try to answer them. I've always been very soft and very ha- try to be helpful. But um, now the response is, well, well, teams of physicians say you're wrong. And they'll post this article in in, uh, in the journal in pediatrics, and and that will win the average person over me any any time. Any concerned mom who's curious about what to feed her kid, are they going to listen to the scientist who's been in biotechnology his whole life, or are they going to listen to a team of scientists at the A or a team of physicians at the AAP? And and that's a no brainer. This has been a shot to our public trust in a perfectly good technology that feeds people, and, and they should be ashamed. Yeah. So, so, you know, and obviously I don't think any of us can speak for the, the authors, the three pediatricians or the editor or AAP more broadly, but you know, what do you, what do we, what do you think is kind of the motivation behind this? Is it, is it solely, you know, AAP kind of low biotechnology literacy and not realizing, you know, the outcome? I mean, I feel like this could be anticipated, right? Because this, this, you know, echoes of Andrew Wakefield and the Lancet and his fake yep. data on the MMR yep. vaccine. And you think that we would have learned from, you know, That's publishing essentially opinion pieces in prestigious journals. But, you know, what do we think is going on here? You know, I, I've been following this um, through the AP for about six years now. Um, and I say six years, I've been a member of the AP for longer, but um, I'd gone to a conference, um, uh, their national conference, and there was a 
uh, talk on uh, food safety and environmental exposures. And I thought, this is going to be great. I'm going to go. They're going to put to rest all these fears. People are going to be educated. It's going to be awesome. And during that lecture, they continued to make people fearful of pesticide residues. They talked about the EWG as a good resource. Now, this was back in, I think, 2017. Um, but when I saw that, I mean, my, my heart sank. And I actually asked the speaker at the end of the lecture, did you know the AAP seek out any agricultural inputs? Have we looked into that? And she wasn't totally aware. Um, but since then, I've kind of followed what they've been doing. And I feel like this is an unfortunate trend. Um, they will have these articles or these little blips in a magazine that say, oh, well, yes, you know, uh, if a family is able to buy organic, they should. But if they're not, it's OK, which is also just ridiculous because that's what you know, you're saying. Oh, this might be poison. But if that's all you can afford, that's OK. It's, it's good enough. Like how contradictory can you get? Um, so while I would love to say this is a one off, I, I fear this is a little bit of a trend. You know, I, I hate saying that someone might have agenda behind this, but it certainly feels this way when when you see this repeated offense over and over. Um, I've offered suggestions. I have put um, uh, evaluations after these lectures and I've written magazines and said, this is what's um, inaccurate. And I've never gotten a response back from anybody um, asking to spread the better science. So, I mean, I'm doing my best, but again, when I'm on a social media board with thousands of physicians and I'm the one person saying this isn't accurate, it's really hard for people to wanna believe me. Um, and, and same thing in, in clinic with, with patients, you know, I say, oh yeah, follow the AAP on vaccines and safe sleep and all that stuff, but don't but follow don't, them on yeah, that. Right, right. It really, it, it erodes your ability to be a good care provider. Um, and, and of course it propagates, you know, just complete misinformation. I mean, aside from, you know, we talk a lot about what's the harm if, you know, a, a healthcare provider, you know, says, oh, well, it's okay if you put potatoes on your feet because you believe it's going to help your, your illness. And, and the harm is it is belief in one piece of misinformation makes someone more likely to believe in more misinformation. And now you're seeing that slope. snowballed, um, from a large medical organization. So it's, right. it, it's, um very problematic yeah can i jump oh. in on the question of yes. intent? yes I, yes I hate, I hate to guess it's someone's intent but when you get certain fingerprints in a manuscript you kind of start to see some patterns and a couple of things were use of inflammatory language like they bring up 2,4-D which mm -hmm. our agent orange i should say agent orange which was a combination of chemistries one of which was co-purifying with something that caused all the problems it wasn't the herbicide 2,4-D they talked about um, glyphosate showing up in uh, meat and milk products, but they didn't say that it hasn't been detected. They just say that it could be a contaminant, okay, a contaminant. They talk about um, a paper. They cite one paper that says there's no consensus on the safety of, of GMO foods, which is a term I absolutely hate. They are ingredients from crops that were genetically engineered. And they're the same exact ingredients as they are in conventional organic food. It's sugar, yeah. sugar, oil as well. But they say there's no consensus. The paper was written by people who give talks against genetic engineering, people who write books against genetic engineering. It's written by the, the same people who have been wrong for 30 years. And yet AAP authors choose to cite that paper over the thousands and thousands of papers that have come out demonstrating safety and efficacy, or even better yet, the lack of papers showing evidence of reproducible harm. Yeah, absolutely. So, and and they're they're often, you know, cherry picking or using that one single study that is uh, poorly designed and they're ignoring the large meta analyses assessing both epidemiological and biological data from 20 years. So, you know, it's it's definitely an illustration of poor um, poor science, poor literature review. So when the AAP put up that post on Instagram that sort of at least alerted me to what was going on, we commented on it and we, you know, we, we basically said we're so disappointed, you know, with, with this statement. And we had multiple people chiming in and saying, are you saying that we shouldn't assess the safety of GMOs and pesticides? Of course, that's not what we're saying. But what, what we're saying is these things have been studied extensively and continue to be studied. And what this statement does is it plants the seed. It implies that we're not assessing, that we don't have evidence of safety. And that is where I think we're all just like 
how how could they have put this up in good content? You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. And I sort of mentioned it before too, but this is right out of the anti-vaccine kind of activism playbook. They say, well, maybe there's a little bit of concern right. or maybe we should look more into this. I'm just asking questions. I'm just asking questions. And you're thinking, but there is research on this. You're not just asking questions. You're planting seeds of doubt by saying, ask questions. They even say in the parent accompanying piece that parents should read the research to make sure right. they know because other news outlets may want to steer them away or uh, steer them away from the fears of GMOs. And I'm thinking, no, that is our job to read the research and tell you what's important and what to follow. Yet they like set up parents that there might be controversy about this. I right. mean, how awful. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of an array of logical fallacies and also this false balance premise where, you know, 25, 30, 40, at this point, it's past 40 years of data, you know, uh, is, is somehow comparable to, you know, this, this paper that conveniently omitted any assessment of organic pesticide residues, you know. Well, and your, uh, your point about uh, more research. One of the lines in the paper says, you know, based on the IARC decision, which maybe we'll talk about, about glyphosate, um, suggests that we need to do more research. That was in 2014. Since then, there have been 77,000 papers published on glyphosate yeah. between the, that decision and this AAP review. And none of them have conclusively shown any particular link to cancer, any mechanistic or epidemiological link that, that's solid. You know, so we'll yeah. talk about that maybe later, but it just is, again, it's that selective use of language to create fear and uncertainty. Yeah. So, so I think it's a good opportunity now to kind of dive into some of the specific statements that are, that are, I mean, they're all really harmful, but maybe some of the more egregious ones. So, you know, maybe I'll, I'll kick things off. So the first thing that they say is that the genetic traits that the seed biotechnology industry has chosen to introduce are limited to herbicide and insect resistance. And the National Academy of Sciences concludes that there are not adequate data to support increase in crop yields as a, as a result of GMO agriculture. So first of all, um, you know, the, the source they're using from National Academy of Sciences was a very long comprehensive paper review from 2016. They actually ignore more recent data and statements from National Academy of Sciences that say the opposite. Specifically, foods made with GMO ingredients do not pose any specific health risks. Um, you know, but of course, they're using National Academy of Sciences to give credibility to this argument. Um, second of all, um, the fact that they're saying that the food crops are herbicide resistant and insect resistant is, is false. Um, there are 10 FDA approved GMO crops currently on the market, um, including sweet corn, soybean, canola, cotton, sugar beets, potatoes, apples, papaya, summer squash, alfalfa. And then also we could throw in the, the Aqua Advantage salmon, who it, which is a, an animal and a, a non-plant organism. Um, and they're not limited to herbicide and insect resistance. For example, we did a post on papaya. If we didn't genetically engineer papaya to resist the papaya ring spot virus, which essentially wiped out papaya crops in Hawaii in the 80s and 90s, we wouldn't have papaya anymore. So we wouldn't have foods. We uh, People who farmed them wouldn't have livelihoods. They wouldn't have incomes. Um, potatoes, there are three, a few different GMOs, but the the main, the more popular GMOs in potato category, they resist a fungus called late blight, which, which actually caused the Irish potato famine, if you're familiar with that. Um, summer squash resists a zucchini yellow mosaic, yellow, yeah, zucchini yellow mosaic virus, which kills a variety of curcubit crops, including your, your squashes. Um, and so, you know, first, it's a, it's a false statement. Second, even if the GM crops that we had available only were tolerant of herbicides, so what? That means that you can spray fewer pesticides, herbicides to kill other weeds and yield more crop and feed more people. You know, I mean, it's it's they say that these traits aren't benefiting people because it's not directly adding nutrition to the food. But here we're talking about things that allow people to grow food to feed people, to have a livelihood, to help the economy. And the data demonstrate if you don't control for pests, whether it's a pathogen pest or an insect or a weed, you don't have crops. So crop yield is a direct consequence of these things. Um, Kevin, I wanna hand it over to you first for some additional comment on this. 
Yeah, yeah. So a whole bunch of comments on this one. So first of all, we've never engineered a crop for yield. <laughs> uh, or it hasn't been approved, right? We could do that. We could have huge yields. We could have higher yields than we do. Um, but again, these are these are traits that are lost in the in the mess. And big agricultural companies, they engineer. So the only only traits that have been engineered in are the ones that can be grown on massive acreage because of the, these traits. Of course, the papaya is a small trait, but that was papaya was an exception because it happened in the 90s. Long story behind papaya. That's awesome. But um, yield increases go up because of severe pest pressure or weed pressure, where these traits really do shine through. The main role of these of these traits for insect and herbicide resistance is to save time and money for farmers. It's about using less fuel. It's about less labor. It's about less time, less tilling, you know, less disruption of the ground. Um, you have less soil loss. These are really important attributes that this article doesn't even consider. They basically say there's no benefit to these crops. Um, farmers wouldn't use them if there was not a benefit. And 90 some percent of farmers are using uh, are they using these for uh, canola, soybeans, corn, um, and corn? Well, corn and soy. A lot of it goes into animal feed, huge amount. Um, and so uh, the uh, price of beef, price of of pork, price of chickens, really is tied to the readily available uh, crops that are being grown on these massive acreages. So food security is a big issue and tied to these. So and the the AAP totally swings and misses on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, you know, they they omit a lot of the the additional economic downstream consequences of having these things. And they omit the fact that there could be more G GMO crop options um, if public pressure and often political pressure um, really didn't halt progress on this. You know, we were I was talking um, recently about HB4, which is a new cultivar of wheat that was developed in Argentina, and it has a gene from sunflowers in it that allow it to essentially survive in times of drought. Um, so it turns on or it regulates gene expression so that it can survive, whereas normal wheat would die pretty quickly in drought conditions. And as we look at the expansion and the acceleration of climate change and increased drought conditions, um, the food security, agriculture stability is going to become more dependent on these types of technologies that are going to allow us to grow crops in places where maybe we previously couldn't or maybe where they used to be able to be grown but because the climate has changed now they're they're under threat from not being able to grow and ultimately provide food to to children right this is the pediatrics right um so so i think That's the Oh, go ahead, Nicole. Sorry, just as a quick aside, too. One of the authors was also um, the past chair of the Committee on Environmental Health. Um, so not only is this a nutrition um, thing, but they're saying that environmentally that GMO or GE technology is not environmentally friendly, but it actually is more friendly than many organic practices that need more land, more resources, more um inputs into the land. So this is helping us be more efficient. And someone from the Environmental Health Committee is saying that they're wrong. Just just something I had to say. <laughs> yeah, it's a great point. And Kevin, you kind of alluded to this, right? You know, a lot of these, these genetic modifications in these crops mean that you don't have to till the soil as much. So you have less erosion, less runoff, meaning that anything you do have to spray on the crops is, is less likely to run off into groundwater. It's less likely to bioaccumulate. Um, and, you know, it means that you can actually um, maintain the land more healthily. So you're not reduced, you know, we hear a lot about nutrient leaching and overtilling. That does that's not happening, right? These are these are um, you know, pseudoscience, misinformation, inflammatory statements that are not founded on reality and and ultimately are recycled by organizations like EWG. Um, so the next thing really gets into kind of the pesticide crux, because I think the 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 thesis of this is that, well, conventional pesticides, pesticides used on GE crops are, you know, we don't know if they're harmful. And of course, conveniently omitting the fact that organic farming uses pesticides, many of which with higher toxicity than um, any of these pesticides that would be used in conventional farming. So they say um, an unfortunate consequence of the increasingly heavy use of herbicides late in the growing season on these tolerant crops um, is that measurable quantities of glyphosate and other herbicides termed residues remain present in GMO grains at harvest. So 
Kevin, I'm going to hand it over to you for the, the crux of this. But first, measurable doesn't mean clinically relevant. Measurable yep. and residue mean that trace levels may have been detected using very sensitive chemistry procedures like HPLC, which is a type of chromatography, to look for trace levels. Residue does not mean something is clinically relevant. Um, and this is the same trope that the EWG uses verbatim about the dirty dozen, the pesticide residues. And of course, they're ignoring toxicological risks. And they're also omitting the fact that organic pesticides are also used. And those residues are not nearly as stringently monitored and regulated compared to conventional pesticides. Um, so Kevin? Yeah, yeah, I should say, you know, I hang out with uh, organic farmers all the time and I, we sell a farmer's market every Saturday and I trust what they do and I trust their use of pesticides to control pests. I mean, they, uh, perfectly safe in my book, just as are conventional. And I also hang around with analytical chemists. A lot of the work we do is looking for molecules that are almost not there. Right. And, uh, and I can tell you, if you want to detect a chemical, there is a way to do it. Yeah. And they can measure glyphosate, and they do measure glyphosate routinely, down into the parts per trillion, which is seconds in 32,000 years, <laughs> which I love that. Like, uh, you know, how, how relevant is seconds in 32,000 years? But this is the level at which these wizards can detect this stuff. And, and, and as you say, it doesn't mean it's clinically relevant. The best part about this is that they're they're looking for glyphosate in the urine, yeah, which is exactly where you'd want to find waste it. Product. <laughs> oh, my body's got rid of it. Right, you're yeah, excreting it totally, like you're supposed to. They, they totally ignore it in context to the levels that are being detected, which are in the parts per trillion, parts per billion, uh, low parts per billion, and then in the pharmacology of this, that it doesn't bioaccumulate; it moves rapidly through the body, and some small amounts metabolized by the liver. But in general, this stuff moves right through you. So they're saying we detect it in so many people, therefore that's a red flag. Uh, as you say, measurable amounts, right? You can measure almost none. Detectable, yep. yes, you can detect almost nothing. It doesn't mean that it's harmful, and it doesn't mean it has any uh, physiological or clinical relevance. Yeah, you know, maybe we should start calling them homeopathic residues because there's right. barely anything left. How about that? I love it. Um, and and of course, you know, just just to remind everyone, glyphosate is obviously conflated with big agriculture, which I kind of hate that phrase because, again, omitting the fact that organic agriculture has big agriculture too. Um, and glyphosate has lower acute toxicity than 94% of other herbicides, including organic ones and other commercial products and lower chronic toxicity than 90% of those. And that includes vinegar, acetic acid, you know, and table salt. And of course, you know, there is no human evidence that glyphosate in these trace amounts is causing harm to people. Now, I always- Andrea, there are lawsuits. What yeah, would you say to know, people who say that? Well, you know, I mean, we know we know lawsuits are not evidence. They're not scientific evidence. It's often people on a jury are are misled by whoever's making the best argument. It's often a a public display, a public, um, you know, um, spectacle, and not necessarily based on reality. Um, but of course, you know, they use that urine paper that, that Kevin, you talked about, and they, they say, um, you know, there's, there's 90, 90 people that are in this study, which is not very strong when you're looking at quality of data. And they say, well, the glyphosate levels were significantly higher, statistically significantly higher amongst the people who, um, you know, ate conventional versus those who ate organic diets. If you actually look at the finite levels, they're pretty damn close. And conveniently, organic diets are not using glyphosate. They're using organic pesticides. And conveniently, this paper did not measure organic pesticide levels in that urine. So they use that to kind of support this claim that, okay, well, people are peeing out some trace levels of glyphosate. And and this presence, these toxic herbicides are the hazard to children's health associated with GMO based food consumption. And, and, you know, the carcinogenic hazards, um, you know, they substantially overshadow theoretical risks. And of course, 
that's 100% false. And they're using the IARC classification and they strategically select the IARC, which is the International um, Association for Research into Carcinogenicity, which is a, a working group of the WHO that assesses hazard, not risk, not actual exposures. And they ignore the food safety experts. So they ignore the European Food Safety Authority. They ignore the FDA. They ignore the JECFA. All of these organizations are literally the experts in food consumption, food ingredients, and food safety. And they're the ones that are looking at actual plausible risk due to exposures. The EFSA, which is the European Food Safety Authority, so let's you know, let's ignore the U.S.-based entities because a lot of people are like, well, the FDA is just in bed with big ag. So, the European Food Safety Authority, though, said concluded concluded that glyphosate is unlikely to pose a carcinogenic hazard to humans, and the evidence does not support classification that the IARC assigned it with regard to carcinogenic potential. So, the IARC has classified glyphosate as a um, probable carcinogen, which means that there's limited evidence in humans. There hasn't been a causal relationship assigned. Um, and and again, probable means something very different in, in this classification than what it means in kind of, you know, lay speak. Um, but, but Kevin, maybe you can comment on, you know, why cherry picking this statement from IARC is, is doing a disservice to the totality of evidence. Yeah, that's really important because the IARC decision when that came out was was earth shaking because this hazard based assessment, which if you dig into the data, uh, they look at, as you mentioned, uh, toxicity in humans, animals and cytotoxicity, and they can show in a Petri dish, maybe it causes some cells to do weird stuff. When they looked at, I think it was 315 studies, they found just a handful of them that may have shown a detail, a little bit of evidence. It, the this decision by IARC was based on scant data and was a hazard based assessment. When you looked at Health Canada and all the ones you named, they say there's no evidence, zero evidence of of carcinogenicity. And the point that I always make is that in the eight or nine years since this assessment was made, there still is no evidence, whether it's uh, molecular, whether it's epidemiological. Um, there's been a couple of meta analyses that if you take uh, a little data from here and a little data from here and you jam them together, maybe you can see a slight association that they say is significant, statistically significant, but not biologically significant. And they also ignore the criticisms of those meta-analyses, which are also published papers that say the meta-analyses, meta-analysis is just where you look at all, um, all the data sets kind of merged and statistically massage them to give you some sort of outcome. Um, that said that they're comparing apples and oranges, which is true. Uh, the work by Jang et al. 2019 really looks at data sets that you can't really compare together. And and what's really interesting about that work is, well, I won't go into that, but they, the, the work here at the AAP conveniently ignores the criticisms of that work, which really show that it was inappropriately combined. So all of the resort to the IARC, um, is used to give this thing, give this stuff, to give the herbicide that can barely be detected a label of a probable carcinogen, which hasn't been substantiated by any of the follow-up and really wasn't, uh, in most people's opinion, uh, a good outcome at the time, a reasonable yeah. synthesis at the time. And Andrea, what we sometimes give examples, and I'm blanking right now, on things, other things that are labeled as probable carcinogen. It's like pickled vegetable. I mean, things that uh, are. No, that's in the aspartame, which is possible. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Um, but okay. I think, but I think maybe has, deli meat. I think deli meat okay. is also in the probable. Um, and again, you know, you're not. Again, you're not looking at likelihood of exposure, dosage, route of administration, exactly. any of these sorts of things. And the irony is then after this whole, you know, well, we're going to we're going to subtly suggest that glyphosate causes cancer. Then they're like um, they, they say in the paper verbatim, a major benefit of organic food is that it substantially reduces dietary exposure to pesticides, which is 100 percent completely false. First of all, organic. I'm going to keep saying, it, I'm going to say it until I'm blue in the face. Organic farming uses pesticides. They just use organic pesticides, which 
are different than the synthetic or conventional pesticides. They include things like copper sulfate, which actually does bioaccumulate and has quite high toxicity. Um, and, and you know, it, it plays on that appeal to nature fallacy. Well, well, the organic pesticides, they're, they're natural, therefore they're better. That's blatantly false. You know, the origin of a pesticide does not dictate its toxicity. Organic pesticides are no more safer or better for the environment or better for the farmers. We hear that a lot. Well, you know, it's not the glyphosate that's on the food. It's the farmers that are spraying, you know, they're, they're dousing the fields in it. And we know we've said repeatedly that the amount of glyphosate used is minuscule on a field because why is someone going to waste money on a pesticide when they only need to use a small amount? They're not dousing anything in it. Um, you know, and, and we know the decades of data demonstrate that organic food is no more nutritious, no safer, no better for the environment. In some cases, it's worse for the environment. Um, they still use pesticides. And what you're doing is using this appeal to nature fallacy to scare people away from consuming produce. I don't care whether it's organic or conventional produce is healthy, nutritious, should be the main component of your diet. And what you're doing is now you're demonizing conventional produce. Well, and I think too, again, kind of bringing it back to like, we're, we're doctors and, and, and we work in clinical practice. I prescribe an antibiotic at a certain dose and I do it for a certain amount of time. And farmers do the same with their chemical use. It costs them money and side effects if they overuse it. So no one wants to do that. They don't want to harm their own health, their own kids' health. I mean, we go out to our field and take corn right off the stock. I have no problem doing that. I would not do that if I thought we were using unsafe levels of this, but that's why there's prescriptions and doses and you do it so you don't get antibiotic associated diarrhea in the clinic and you do it appropriately in the field so you can control weeds, but not have cost of chemical and land usage and soil erosion and all these other things. So it's, again, it's the same argument. How, how did we miss that? Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, do you want to comment on kind of the, the, the dichotomy or the disconnect between the, the organic pesticides and the conventional pesticides here? Well, that's, that's really funny because um, uh, organic pesticides are just natural poisons. Yeah. <laughs> and years ago, they could even use rotenone, which is like horribly toxic. So to bad, it right? So I know. Allowable. It still may be allowable in some places. But, um, you know, we use organic pesticides. We use copper sulfate. We use... Um, uh, we use Dipel, which is BT, which is the same protein, which is installed in the crop with a genetically engineered crop, which, which is awesome because instead of having to apply it and have it get washed off, it costs tons of money for Dipel, uh, the, um, uh, the plant makes its own protection. Yeah. And we could be putting this thing in the broccoli and cauliflower. Where we have cabbage loopers or in the cucurbits where we get pickle worms and all the problems that we have to apply the Dipel. It sure would be nice to have plants that made their own. So it's one of these things that when I put on my farmer assistant hat, my wife does all the farming, um, I would I would wish that we had these tools in it, it, to use. Uh, it would be awesome if we did, but uh, but we don't. And, and so it, it, you have to be very careful when you look at these questions. I know that you mentioned before that they don't test for the organic ones with the EWG, but the EWG will say we detected 52 pesticides on a strawberry. Right. And so a family says, OK, well, we don't want strawberries now. Right. I work with strawberry farmers. We might apply one or two per season. But if you look at the totality of USDA data over the entire country, maybe there are 52 different ones that are applied different Total. times a year. To right. Us, to us. And so then you just add the it all together. You add it all together and frame it as look what they're doing to poison your kids. It right. is so irresponsible and it hurts the farmer and hurts families. And they also omit the fact that even if they detected all these things over the course of a year on a field or, you know, on a plant, all of those levels are well orders of magnitude below the thresholds that are set by the regulatory agencies for these levels of pesticides. Again, pesticides are just chemicals, like everything is a chemical. Um, and those levels, those thresholds are really conservative because it's, it's a threshold that is going to essentially eliminate any health risk for any group of people, including those that may have, you know, metabolic issues or things that may make them at increased risk for potential adverse events, right? So, oh, so they're, is, they're over-exaggerating. 
sorry, the AAP actually has um, mentioned that too, that they feel as though that these residue um, tolerance levels are not set at a point that are safe for children who are growing and developing. They're also not safe for fetuses and pregnant people. And while I uh, appreciate, again, their concern that kids are growing and developing rapidly, um, they have never even looked to see that the tolerances are tens if not hundreds of times below a level that would cause harm. Um, and when they do um, claim that that is happening, they say, well, it's not actually being followed. Even though that level <laughs> is set by the EPA, they say it's not actually being followed. So they're just kind of making it up now. I, yeah, so, they're just, yeah, they're just throw, they're just throwing out things that don't, don't agree. And it's really interesting because, you know, Kevin, I, I love the way you put it, because when you're talking about anything that, the word ends in sidle, right? That means to kill, right? And, you know, people get this, you know, they get really hung up on this appeal to nature fallacy. And we were like, lots of things in nature can kill you at very low exposures. Look at ricin, look at rosary peas, look at, and you know what? You know why the plants make those things? So that things don't eat them because they're trying to protect themselves. So, you know, we're extracting those same things that they're making that are killing things, trying to eat them. And the major difference with conventional pesticides is that we can tweak them a little bit to make them biodegrade faster or make them more pure or reduce the likelihood that they'll kill non-target species. So, you know, there's several um, organic fungicides that, um, or sorry, organic insecticides that, um, you know, they're intended to kill aphids, but they also kill the predators of aphids like lady beetles. And so, yeah, you're killing the pest, but you're also killing the thing that naturally would would kill the pest to begin with. So you're not really helping the situation, but people would rather use that than a synthetic one that has been altered so it doesn't target the lady beetle. Um, it's just, it's just a, a, you know, obviously I think it really goes to how effective these fear-based marketing campaigns are um, and, and generally, you know, the lack of knowledge on kind of chemistry and, and you know, the appeal to nature fallacy here. So, so I'm, I'm, oh, sorry, Kevin, go on. I no, just want to mention that what people want is that it, they don't want to see a non-zero number, right? And that they want zero risk, and that doesn't happen. That it's driving the car. With anything, yeah. It does with anything. And so a part per trillion is one part per trillion too many for most moms who are feeding their kids. And I understand that. You know, I'm a parent of, of an eight-month-old, and she's awesome. Um, and I wouldn't want to expose her to anything. But I have a handle on what a part per trillion is. And yet that language has a, has a significant risk to parents. And so when AAP endorses it, it really, really digs in. So, so you just hit the nail on exactly what I wanted to, to say, which is how did this happen? How did this national trusted medical organization get it so wrong? And how do we, like, I, I don't know, for me now it calls into question everything that they say. You know, how do we navigate trusting this organization and other organizations because we always say i mean andrea and i always say you, know, you have to trust the scientific consensus and that often means turning to these organizations that one would hope is really assessing the totality of data and evidence on a particular topic so i don't know nicole can you maybe comment like how do you as a pediatrician you know, as a member of aap how do you plan to navigate this moving forward yeah, well, you know, I, I do think this is going to be a little bit of an impetus for me to maybe uh, get out there a little more and maybe try to do more work myself um, and hopefully create a ripple effect, um, try to educate as many people as I can. Um, but it's going to be tough. Um, it's just one of those things that I think um, we're going to have to do day by day um, and person by person and kind of show people that that it's going to be um, okay, and that the AAP is an organization that is fallible. We're all fallible. We make mistakes. There are realities versus recommendations. And I'll tell parents about that a lot of times in clinic when they say, oh, I just don't really think I can make um, whatever recommendation we're talking about happening. And I'll say, okay, this is the reality of, of what you're dealing with with your infant at home, and this is the recommendation. Let's find a way that we can maybe come to the middle ground a little bit. And I think this is where the reality of the situation and the recommendation don't jive. And I'm hoping over time they can, I don't know if make amends is, is the appropriate thing, but make future statements that can help us realize that they know that they can be wrong and, and that it's okay to be wrong, but the important thing is to fix it and to um, be responsible about it in the future and learn from it. 
It's so important. Um, you know, I think this was, you know, obviously we could talk about this for hours, but, but obviously, you know, we have to wrap, but, um, but, but Kevin, any last thoughts, um, you know, about kind of a, that's that same question. And then, you know, for both of you, I think before we wrap, what can people do, you know, when they come across this type of misinformation, when they listen to this episode or watch this episode, you know, what can the, the everyday person do or what can scientists do or what can other pediatricians or clinicians do to help mediate some of the anticipated harms that this is going to have? Yeah, I love this. This is what I always talk about in my action step. You have roles on two levels. You can create content and you can amplify the good content of others. And so what I plan to do is write a review of the review for pediatrics. And I've already started this thing. I got going on it. I'm going to put it on a preprint server so everyone can see it. And if uh, AAP decides to publish it, great. If they don't, we'll send it somewhere else. But this needs to be in a, it, a response needs to be in a visible place. Uh, the other things I'll do is a podcast like this. I'm doing lots of writing and discussing on the subject. Um, Nicole and I had a conversation that's available on YouTube. You can check out if you'd like to we see. We will link it a slightly also. Different take. Yeah, that I'll also link in the show notes. But so create content. Talk about the AAP mistake, but don't do it in a way that criticizes AAP for a, 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 a bad show as much as they are so important and so influential that we need to hold their hand to get it right. And that, with that kind of attitude, we're not doing an us versus them. We're on their side. Absolutely. We need them to be strong. We need them to be effective. And with that kind of ethos, it's much more penetrant that people will believe what we say. Um, the other side of this is amplification. It means that share this podcast, share the writing that's done around this, share the other syntheses, the tweets, the Facebook, you know, share, share, share. Um, that. AAP article will reach millions of, of important, influential people. It'll misinform many people. We are, we are, there are a lot more of us than there are of them. And we just need to amplify the good work that's done by others. So important. Yeah, so true. And and of course, you know, if anyone listening to this is a journalist, reporter, media outlet, anyone who thinks that they can help amplify or want to speak with kind of the the body of experts with regard to these topics, you know, you know how to find us. We will obviously link to how to find Nicole and Kevin. These are very important conversations. And, and as Kevin, you know, so eloquently said, it's not about, you know, us versus them. It's not about we're right, they're wrong. It's about helping science literacy, improving public health, in, improving health outcomes, and, and alleviating completely unsubstantiated fear. People don't need to, there's enough things to worry about in the world. People do not need to worry about these sorts of things. And it just adds to anxiety and stress and, and it gets compounded as social media, um, you know, propagates misinformation. Absolutely. And maybe Andrea, just one, one final thing is, you know, we often talk about the risk, uh, the risk perception gap and it's, People focusing and obsessing over this, which, I mean, we've done a point by point takedown of why you shouldn't be concerned about, you know, about um, GE technology and, and all that. Um, and we're not focusing on the much more important issues. And I, we touched on some here, but, you know, um, just eating your veggies, your fruits, you know, getting the produce in your diet. We're just, we're, we're focusing on the wrong things and we're placing um, unnecessary weight on something that really poses such I mean, no risk, no evidence of risk. Um, and anyway, it's just, I mean, this is such an important topic and I think it gets at a much larger issue. So really Nicole and Kevin, oh, sorry, Nicole. Yeah. Well, because we all eat, this affects us all. Yeah. So oh, yes message be that you should choose whatever produce looks good to you. If you like organic, if you want conventional, both types of farmers and farming methods can be safe um, and use chemicals safely because they're prescribed amounts when they're being used. So buy what you can find, what you can afford, what looks good to you. Just eat more produce. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Andrea, do you want to take us home? Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you, Nicole and Kevin, for joining us for this very important topic. Um, really, really excited that this is kicking off the new year. Um, you know, we uh, we've got big plans for 2024 and it's and it's all going to come back to improving science literacy and public health. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you.
to our listeners, thanks thanks for joining. We hope you learned a thing or two. And if you want to support our efforts and help us grow the impact and reach, please consider sending us a donation. You can find that on our website. You can also pick up a snarky piece of merch like relevant today's episode, you, you are a sack of chemicals t-shirt. I'm going to rock mine. Um, that's all on our website, which is www.unbiasedipod.com. And you can sign up for our sub stack, which includes uh, periodic newsletters and offers a way to sub- support us through subscription. That's the unbiasedipod.substack.com. And of course, make sure to share credible science. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel or our social channels or both. Our handle and all of them is at Unbiased SciPod. Catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science.